Commission of UNESCO, the United Nations uh, body, body um, responsible for ocean science and observations. So today we have uh, uh, a little but very important side event organized by uh, Carol Turley, uh, my, my neighbor. Uh, Carol actually is uh, organized the whole event and uh, I was simply asked to, to chair it. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that this event will be su very successful because we have uh, an outstanding team of people involved in many aspects of uh, adaptation and mitigation, uh, and assessing impacts of climate change on the ocean. Uh, and the focus here will be on showing to you the cascade of events that come from emissions, then go into ocean uh, absorbing carbon, then going into acidification, then, then going to biological consequences of that. And then it will come back because it will also have influence on climate. So ocean was to some extent neglected uh, in the process of United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change until I would say there was a breakthrough last year in the Paris Agreement when for the first time in the history of these conferences and agreements uh, the health of ocean ecosystems was explicitly mentioned in the text of, of the agreement. So we have to capitalize on this. Uh, the role of the ocean is incredibly important as the main mitigator of most warming and also, of course, of, of carbon um, uh, uh, component of the climate system. So, uh, but, but we're going to be very specific, focusing on global things like mitigation and adaptation, but focusing also on ocean acidification because this is something that is probably less discussed in the context of these conferences and in the climate change community. So, we have. Uh, we have eight speakers, uh, seven minutes per, per person, and we hope to have uh, a good discussion session. So our first speaker would be actually Carol Turley. Now I would like uh, to introduce Carol. Uh, and uh, I, would, I think be correct if I call Carol the champion in outreach. And also she is a, a, a prominent marine biogeochemist. But she is a real champion in making the ocean acidification known to, to the circles uh, of COP20, of, of COP, uh, of Conference of Parties. It was the first time that she uh, did it. It was in, in Conference of Parties in 2009. And uh, it is really important to convey the scientifically sound message on the importance and uh, the processes involved in ocean acidification into the communities involved in the negotiations here. And Carolyn does it very successfully. So she was able to put to, uh, together a very strong team of speakers today. And uh, Carol, you have uh, actually the first uh, presentation, which will be called Why Ocean Change Matters to Society and United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Vladimir, thank you. And welcome to this event. I would just say Plymouth Marine Laboratory has organized this Okay, Plymouth Marine Laboratory uh, has organized this side event, not me, so, so um, I, I, there's a lot of people working on this. If, if there are people here that are Facebook or Twitter, is Twitter ocean information out there, please. Okay. So, can you hear me up here? Excellent, excellent. Of course, I can't see from here, but never mind. Um, I, I gave myself the simple role of reminding us all of how important the ocean is to all of us, to society, but also to the UNFCCC and the COP negotiations that are going on here. Um, you all know the ocean covers 70% of the surface of the planet, it's what makes life different on this on this planet compared to others and it actually um, offers uh, over 90% of the living space on the planet because it's so deep, we have such a deep unexplored ocean. Um, it also provides 50% of the primary 
production on planet Earth carried out by microscopic plants, so hugely important. And this productivity, like on, like on land, is distributed unevenly around the world, with some great hot spots, with some great ocean deserts as well. It controls our, our weather. Um, here you can see how storms and uh, rainfall is controlled by the ocean, including cyclones and hurricanes. It also controls our climate with the heat uh, being distributed by the ocean currents. Uh, for example, in Britain, it would have the uh, climate of Norway if it wasn't for the warming currents. So we're kind of pleased about the ocean. Um, the ocean is a major source of oil and gas, but it, it also offers these other sustainable forms of energy, that, which we're just beginning to use now. So the ocean has a lot to offer as well. And believe it or not, around 90% of the trade goes across the, the ocean. And a lot of the cities are... 50% of the world's population live close to the coast. And over 75% of all the cities are on the coast. So you should start getting worried now when you sort of see these statistics. And the ocean actually controls many of the greenhouse gases and non-greenhouse gases it produces for example 50 percent of the oxygen in the atmosphere so it's kind of pretty important to life on earth and it controls car carbon dioxide for example the emissions that we produce sorry i have overrun myself there <laughs> so healthy marine ecosystems are hugely important for coastal protection as you know, reefs, mangoes, and uh, salt marshes all protect our coasts from storms and waves. And they offer huge uh, um, habitats for biodiversity um, and important pharmaceutical and genetic material. And aesthetically, they're hugely important. And culturally, they're hugely important to us. And of course, they're great inspiration for science and art as well. Um, healthy marine ecosystems also so support jobs and tourism, leisure. We, I mean, I like to be by the sea. I live by the sea. Um, and last but not least, the oceans are hugely important for jobs, for food, um, and supporting millions of people in terms of livelihoods and protein sources. About 11% of, of protein is marine protein. And Cultured and non-cultured fish and aquaculture rely on healthy marine ecosystems and full biogeochemical cycles and full food web dynamics. So it's hugely important that whole cycle feeds back to what we eat. So what the ocean is doing is, is taking up 27% of the carbon emissions that we put into the atmosphere already. And when you add CO2, and water, you form an acid. And this goes through a, a complex cycle, or, or um, carbonate cycle, and it results in a change in the carbonate chemistry. So the ocean become more acidic. But also, they're absorbing um, over 90% of heat from global warming. And that's causing the oceans to warm. So we've got another problem, acidification and warming. And the ocean is also receiving all the water from melting ice. And that, along with the thermal expansion caused by warming, is creating sea level rise. So the ocean is really at the frontier, the front line of climate change. So, to me, it's perfect thinking. So, why should the UNFCCC actually take oceans into account? You can see this is a quote from. Um, the Article 2 of the UNFCCC Convention and to achieve stabilisation of greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference for the climate system. So that's an objective of the UNFCCC. And the ocean is clearly part of that climate system according to the definition of the UNFCCC which is the totality of the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, 
the biosphere and the geosphere. So the UNFCCC has to own the oceans too. It goes on to say that such a level of greenhouse gases should be achieved within a time frame sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to climate change, to ensure that food production is not threatened, and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. So clearly, the ocean has lies within the remit of the UNFCCC. You know, it's it's the change is happening so fast to the ocean that it must be part of the discussions here at this COP and in the future. So I would like to thank the audience for listening to me. Thank you very much, Carol. And you know, this was an introductory presentation. Now we go into, into more details. And of course, the, the role of carbon dioxide emissions uh, uh, by impacting ocean, the ocean is, is the key for this audience. So the next speaker is Professor Hans Otto Bertner. Uh, he is a most prominent marine biologist with uh, specification in marine physiology. So uh, he has a huge load on his shoulders now because he's a co-chair of IPCC Working Group 2. So everything which is related to the impact of climate, climate change on the ocean has to be kind of processed by Hans and he has to come with a consolidated view on, on, on the process and this view has to be expressed in the new editions of the IPCC report, which inform the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the process, including the special report on the ocean and cryosphere. So he has that holistic view on, on, the, on the substance of climate change, and this I wanted to give the floor to Hans Otto. So every speaker, seven minutes, with some warnings that is going to be, uh, that are going to be shown to you very soon. Hans Otto. It's better if you speak from here. Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot for the possibility to speak here and tell you about the ocean results from AR5 and, and also a little bit about what has been happening since then. And uh, considering CO2 emission pathways certainly is also important in an ocean context, like we've heard from, from Carol before. The oceans are warming and depending on which on which uh, pathway we will be going for, it may be ambitious emission reduction, which is following the, the blue trajectory, or we go in, into a warmer future for the world and also for the oceans, and the ocean temperatures are shown to you here. Also, we have the decision to make now whether we want to go into ambitious mitigation with respect to the process of ocean acidification, reducing CO2 emissions substantially, so the acidification trend that you see on this panel will be kept in balance. The alternative is shown there, an unabated acidification trend with business as usual scenarios. And also the oceans are losing oxygen because they are getting warmer, they are getting more stratified, and especially in mid-water layers, the oxygen deficient waters are expanding, affecting marine life. So these are the key ocean climate drivers which cause acidification, warming, and oxygen, and CO2 is certainly the master driver for all of them. Now, the last assessment report has identified ecosystems that are very vulnerable to climate change, and one of them is the Arctic sea ice system. And you all see the choices that can be made here on the left-hand side. You see what is remaining in a 1.5 degree world, and on the right-hand side, what will be happening in a world warmer than two degrees, where we will be losing the sea ice system in the summer almost entirely. It will be marginalized. So these are the choices that are ahead of us. But we can already say, if we keep to the Paris Convention and the Paris decision, there may be some summer sea ice intact in a 1.5 degree warmer world. Another ecosystem that has been identified to be very vulnerable are the warm water coral reefs, which are under various pressures. And you see what will be happening in a warmer world here on these figures, illustrative figures, where you see a healthy reef on the left-hand side, one that is being fed 
and being maintained by its capacity to to uh, provide to, by the uh, salt santella, the the algae that provide the energy for for these corals. Now, if the water gets too warm, these organisms lose the corals. You see that in the centerpiece, they are bleaching. And if this is taking too long, if they cannot recover, essentially the reef turns into a desert. Now, this figure shows that we have already, on the left-hand side, lost about 50% of life coral cover in the Great Barrier Reef along the Australian coast as a prominent example. And there are various processes involved. You see that to the right and bleaching, the bluish color is not yet or has not yet played such a major role compared to the others like intense cyclones or uh, predators feeding on the reef. But if we look back just a little bit in time, what the large, what the larger Nino has been doing to this coral reef just recently, and uh, we, we have to appreciate that bleaching will play a much bigger role in the future, and that there is a high risk of losing up to 90% of coral reefs and their services to humankind already in a 1.5 degree warmer world. Now, what else is happening in the ocean? Species are moving, fish are moving, fisheries catch potential is displaced to different areas, and the reddish area, especially in the low latitudes, shows you that the organisms are leaving the places where they've formerly been. There is a decrease in fisheries catch potential there, which adds certainly then, and which is exacerbated by, by the loss of the warm water coral reef ecosystems. These fish stocks are moving north, and they are declining altogether, and this is a projection for a two degree warmer world by mid-century. These trends are exacerbated by oxygen loss. This is a new finding after the AR5. So we have to face different risks in the ecosystems, in marine ecosystems. And to the right you see the risk assessment as done by working group two of the IPCC, where risk is defined as an overlap of vulnerability, exposure, and hazards and the color scale is being used to illustrate the level of risk. And you see it here in the columns for ocean acidification only, and just look at the transition phases between yellow and red, and you see how the transition between 1.5 and 2 makes a difference. Maybe not so much for ocean acidification only, but if you look at the combined effects to the right-hand side, you see that the transition is happening between the two temperatures. So there may be a reason to go for 1.5 instead of 2. And if we do a risk assessment for various ocean sectors, and that has been done in this figure, and just focus on the yellow area in the center, you see a black line, which is depicting the present situation. And then you see a white line, a full white line, which represents the 1.5 world. And there's only one area, the warm water falls, which where, where, this, where a high risk level is, is being reached. But if we go to the, IND, the present INDCs, the climate targets or emission reduction targets, then we will see, we see that we are moving into the red area altogether. So we are close and the safety space, the planetary safety space is, is really quite narrow as illustrated here. An additional point is sea level rise, and we have a high uncertainty about this. Projections in the R5 were still talking about sea level rise up to one meter by the end of century, but the newer findings tell us that even in a 1.5 degree world, there may be higher changes. And in a two degree world, these changes may be reaching even higher. And the uncertainty is high, so projections range long term beyond the 2100 between sea levels above three meters even. And this matches paleo findings where in a world that has experienced similar degrees of warming, there have been relatively high levels of sea level rise to be considered. So we need to adapt, that is clear. And this is necessary and is occurring. But it's also very clear that without ambitious mitigation adaptation, uh, we will not be able to keep the world in a shape as it currently is. Thank you very much. And uh, just to say, the IPCC will further address these issues in a special report on 1.5 degree global warming 
and then also in the second special report on climate change and the oceans and the cryosphere. Thank you. So thank you very much, Hans Otto. You know, Hans Otto, in order to, to, uh, to watch the presentation, it's better if you see there, then you will see all of them. And then we will collect all the panel uh, for all the sessions, uh, questions and advances session. So the next speaker is uh, Professor Ulf Ribizel. Uh, he is with uh, Geomar in, in Kiel, in Germany. Uh, so Ulf is uh, a marine biologist, and he's done a lot in understanding how ocean acidification may, may affect ocean life. This required a lot of experiments, and uh, so he is the leading scientist in, in, in the aspects of ocean acidification. So, uh, uh, we will have the floor, and uh, the talk is on ocean acidification, and the latest results obtained in the leading country in the science, Germany. Thank you, Vladimir. I will speak from here to avoid bending down all the time. Um, I would like to raise awareness for positive feedback. No, I mean, I don't hear you. Sorry. You can't hear me? No, sorry. I can speak. Uh, you wish to speak from here. You can speak from here. And... I can try this. Okay. Does that work? Raising awareness for positive feedback. That's uh, a concept to us, at least the title you see here. Um, recipe for disaster and the concept is that that doesn't generally work with our uh, general life because uh, we all think of Carol does this work oh, okay. okay doesn't work with uh, everyday's life because we all think of positive feedback as a nice thing when uh, friends, colleagues, or family gives us uh, some positive feedback, we like that. As an Earth system scientist, you have a different view because uh, positive feedback means trouble because it enhances the changing of a process. A driver may be uh, being warming, warming, uh, increasing ice melting, decreasing albedo, and increasing the absorption of heat coming from sunlight. That's kind of trouble for the Earth system. Okay, now we have a pointer. So, positive feedback to an Earth system scientist means amplify initial change. Well, the ocean being such a major driver in uh, uh, climate in the climate system, are there any signs for positive feedbacks from the ocean system? And we've looked at this, and a recent example I would like to show you comes from <coughs> one of the smallest members of the uh, marine plankton community from Coppolithophos. They're too small to be seen uh, with your naked eye, but at times they form massive blooms, uh, mass accumulations, which can be seen from out of space, as you see here, just uh, west of Ireland. And over time, they have accumulated massive amounts of calcium carbonate at the sea floor. So they're major players in our Earth system. To see how they respond to ocean change, we have uh, exposed them to high CO2 conditions in an area here at the uh, west coast of Norway where they normally bloom in the springtime, as you see up here. And we've exposed them to different CO2 concentrations as expected for, for the future in these uh, huge mesocosms. And what we found is that under normal present-day CO2 conditions, they do what they expected to do, the most prominent one being Emiliana huxleyi, the species you see here. They form bloom in the fjord as well as in our mesocosms. Under high CO2 conditions, however, that bloom formation fails. They cannot reproduce fast enough to outbalance the losses due to grazing, infection, and so on, and bloom formation basically stops. That is not only bad news for this tiny critter, it also has major implications for the uh, ecosystem as well as for biogeochemical cycling. And two examples are shown here. Failure of Emiliania to bloom means that the production of the cooling agent dimethyl sulfide, a very important agent in cloud formation, is reduced by 50% in this experiment. That's a positive feedback because it decreases the albedo from clouds and 
at the same time we see that the export of calcium carbonate and with it the export of organic matter into the deep ocean is decreased greatly, 80% less calcium carbonate that being used as ballast for organic matter and 25% reduced organic matter flux. Again, that's a positive feedback because it means less calcium carbonate being sequestered in the deep ocean. What other feedbacks are there in the ocean to expect? These are the two ones I, I mentioned here, reduce DMS production, increasing albedo, and declines of the ballast effect due to a loss of calcium carbonate production in the ocean, which reduces the uh, C2 sequestration. Others that we should have a very close look at are um, the temperature-induced effects on the balance between heterotrophic and autotrophic processes. We know that heterotrophs usually benefit more from increasing temperatures than autotrophs. This also may reduce CO2 sequestration. We also know that um, the combination of temperature and CO2 increases the uh, proportion of small phytoplankton cells. So shifting the phytoplankton community to tiny cells, which enhances the microbial loop, enhances the respiration of uh, organic matter, again reduces CO2 sequestration. And a third or a fifth example in this line here is the effect of decreasing oxygen concentration, possibly increasing the uh, production of N2O. Again, a very climate uh, uh, relevant gas, uh, which could increase greenhouse traffic. So all of these feedbacks and probably several others that we're not even aware of could potentially feed back to the climate system. At present, we don't know much about the capacities and longevities of these processes, so it's a bit too early to say what the uh, uh, feedback strength might be, but uh, clearly they're too important uh, to be ignored at this stage. And with that, I close my presentation and thank you for your interest. Thank you very much, Ulf. You know, uh, I think it's very important that we uh, dig deeper in, in the science of ocean acidification and uh, this science is developing very fast. But it, it is also equally important that already now we start to understand the implications of the changes in the ocean on, on for different seas, for different basins. So now we have uh, uh, Nere Sh uh, Shaltut. Uh, she is associate professor from the, uh, the National Institute of Oceanography and Fisheries uh, in Alexandria, in Egypt, and she is actually in rural and coastal oceanography, knowing uh, how to turn algae into biofuels and, and, and many other things that are very important for management of, of the ocean. So, uh, Nera, the floor is yours, and there you are. The African perspective for the climate change and ocean acidification. The continent Africa stands for the equator, for the equator and extends to about 35 latitude north and south. The African coastal line total of 35,000 kilometers. Total population is 1.2 billion persons equivalent to 1.6 to 16 percent of the total world population. The total land area is 29 million ki uh, square kilometer. UNICEF projection for the, that the African population may hit 4 billion by 2010, by 2100. The fisheries and agriculture sector contribute significantly into Africa economy, and the value added by the fisheries sectors, even of the whole inland marine and capture uh, fisheries fossil licensing and local flats and aquaculture was estimated to, grow to, to be more than 24 billion US dollars, which uh, in, two, in 2011, and this representing 1.26% of the gross domestic product of all African catches. Captured fisheries, marine, inland, and aquaculture combined contributes to more than one third of Africa animal protein intake, and for coastal countries, it represents more than two-thirds two of total animal protein intake. <coughs> the African extensive inland fisheries contain more than 3,000 fisher species and account for two-thirds of the global fishery production. Unlike marine fisheries, the catch from inland fisheries 
it's, take, it's not exported outside, it's taken by the local people, uh, African people. Demand for fisheries is projected to increase substantially in Africa over the next few decades, in consistence with the projected increasing in the human population. Uh, and it's uh, to meet the fish food demand by 2020, it's expected or it's estimated that aquaculture production in Africa would have an increase by 1500%. So, uh, unfortunately, African fisheries suffer from overfishing, illegal fishing, and environmental stressors. Considering that 25% of all the marine catches around Africa are still by non African countries, it's also if also these catches were caught by African states, in theory they could generate an additional value of 3.3 million US dollars, which is eight times higher than the current 0.4 million US dollars that countries earn from fisheries agreements. Based on the previous, so coastal and ocean systems are important for the economics and livelihood of African countries, and climate change will increase challenges for existing stressors such as over exploration resources, habitat degradation, loss of biodiversity, sanitization, pollution, and coastal erosion. In Africa, fisheries mainly count or depends on two ecosystems, coral reef ecosystem and upwelling ecosystem. These two ecosystems are affected in great extent by ocean acidification and climate change. And this increasing in surface temperature, decreasing this upwelling. The component effects of global warming and ocean acidification have been demonstrated to lower both coral reef productivity and resilience. This effect will have consequences on biodiversity, ecology, and ecosystem services. It's noted that the coral reef vulnerability to heat anomalies is high in the eastern coast, more than the southern eastern coast of Africa, which is more resistant, resilient to this increasing in high temperature. The Canary Aquatic System and the Atlantic Equatorial Aquatic System is one of, uh, are one of the most productive systems of the all ocean around the world. And the FAO 2014 report nominated Morocco as one of the, as the most the major producer of, in terms of fish catch, and the total land weight was 1,158,000 tons in 2012. Changing temperature in the Canary upwelling system during the last 90, period 1950 to 2009 has resulted in decreasing productivity and change to the important fish species. And the number of the biological processes in fish production and it influenced a number of biological processes in fish production sensitivity and resilience. The Benguela current to the west, southwest Africa is uh, affected by increasing climate and the upwelling intensity decreases.